I think if you, if you look at the American short story, which to me is one of the most remarkable contributions from the United States in the 20th century, if you look at the modern short story, I don't think there's anybody who is more of a master of the form than Flannery O'Connor. I think, I think it's in the 50 years since her death, I think it's become even more apparent what a master of the form she was. And no matter what your background is in religion of any kind, you're thrown up against that moment of uh, who you are, where you are, why you are. Now, if you don't want to answer that, you can do whatever you want to do. But there is a moment that that has to be dealt with. And I think O'Connor's stories come down to that and deal with that. Her cold, precise, brutal style has the shocking power of a blow between the eyes, a New York Times critic once said of her work. For a young woman known for her reserve and deep religious beliefs, Flannery O'Connor's stories had a surprisingly visceral quality. In two novels and more than some 32 short stories, her unsuspecting characters came face to face with vandals, con men, even an escaped killer. But for O'Connor, these calamities had an even deeper, more mysterious effect, shaking the victim from his own spiritual stupor. Propelled by her wry humor and incomparable sense of irony, O'Connor's tales of crisis and awakening remain vital contributions to American literature. Flannery O'Connor was born March 25, 1925, in Savannah, Georgia, the only child of Regina Klein and Ed O'Connor, a World War I veteran who had taken up a career in real estate. In a number of respects, O'Connor's parents couldn't have been more different. The product of a middle-class family, Edward was easygoing, playful, and quick to praise virtually anything his daughter did. Regina, meanwhile, hailed from a wealthy, politically prominent family in central Georgia. In line with her well-heeled background, she tried to raise Mary Flannery as a proper Southern lady, gently correcting her small breaches of etiquette and carefully choosing the playmates that would enter their threshold. What they had in common was a strong Catholic faith, something that cast them as outsiders in 1920s Georgia. By raising their child in Lafayette Square, an enclave for Irish Catholics in the heart of Savannah, the couple enjoyed something of a buffer from the intolerance that others with their background sometimes endured in the South. In their three-story row house across from the towering Cathedral of St. John the Baptist, her doting parents tried to create a safe haven where she could feel secure. There was those signs out, help wanted, no Irish, uh, you know, so there were things like that. I think she had a very much of an awareness of, of being a second class citizen. While her parents did their best to make Mary Flannery fit in, there were early signs that the child was going to do things her own way. Never was that more clear than when, at the age of five, she remarkably taught her pet chicken to walk backward as well as forward. Word of the unusual trick spread in the local press. Eventually, the Pathé newsreel firm sent a cameraman to capture the stunt, bringing O'Connor and her hen to big screens across the country. Here's Mary O'Connor of Savannah, Georgia, holding the only chicken in the world that actually walks backward. O'Connor seemed to relish her first brush with fame, once calling the episode the high point of her life. But during most of her youth, she spent more time averting attention than seeking it. At the parochial school she attended, O'Connor was painfully shy, once describing herself as, quote, a pigeon-toed child with a receding chin and a you-leave-me-alone-or-I'll-bite-you complex. Years later, Mary Flannery, who even as a child called her parents by their first names, admitted feeling older than most kids her age. At her Catholic grade school, she went so far as to skip the Sunday children's mass in order to attend with adults later in the day. When the decision landed her in hot water with the nuns, O'Connor exhibited an unusual confidence. She had to stand up in class every Monday morning when she was attending St. Vincent's uh, because uh, she had to answer the questions, why, you know, why weren't you there? 
And of course, she had that great answer. Uh, that is just one of my favorite things to share, you know. Catholic Church does not dictate to my family what time I attend Mass.